Welcome back to Echo Ridge and another episode here in the dumpster fire. Oh my gosh, what happened to the food? The dust caps seem to be growing just fine. We have 20 minus 3 tiles, so 17 total dust caps, which my handy calculator says is good for about 6 dupes, 6 and a half. What was past Echo thinking? All right, it's not going to be too big of a deal. We have one bog bucket that is ready to be harvested. And we have a swamp chard here. Ooh, plus we have a pod. Maybe there's some food in it. No, there's Paku. Ooh, as a matter of fact, there is food in here. We'll just take maybe like, you know, a couple of them and turn them into food. Here, fishy, 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 fishy. With the immediate disaster averted, we have over 6,000 calories. I'm going to plant a couple more dust caps. Although we're already having polluted oxygen issues here, interfering with our carbon dioxide, which I still think was caused by that weird bug that I showed you in the last episode. Either way, we're going to work around it. But today, I think it's time that we tame this cool sauce geyser. Well, not necessarily tame, because you don't really have to do anything to tame it. But at the minimum, we're going to analyze it, put a pump in here, and start sending that water over. I suppose we don't have to be in too big of a hurry. We have a lot of polluted water. And adding more polluted water to the mix isn't going to help anything. So I suppose the real issue I need to figure out for this playthrough is getting some sustainable sand. Or ignoring the sand completely and cleaning the polluted water in another way. Not using our handy dandy water sieve. Which I know a lot of you say, well, just heat it up. And when you heat up the polluted water, it'll turn into steam. And also drop off some beautiful dirt. And this is a good idea and one that we'll use sometime in the future... The issue is we don't have the research or the technology to do that immediately because we'll need something like a thermal aqua tuner to be able to cool it back down. Not a big deal, we just have some work to do. Why don't we start by grabbing the metal refinery. We already have the kiln so we can get some production going. From there, I think we'll go full bore into the thermal aqua tuner. Yeah, we don't immediately have the tech for the steam turbine, but we can worry about that when we get there. Speaking of research, I also want to make sure I don't ignore the fact that I'm missing out on the laboratory bonus right now. So we're going to seal all this in. And now we should be getting that laboratory bonus for our research. It's not a big bonus, but it's not bad either. You can see Callie here is getting a 10% speed bonus for working inside of a lab, plus we're getting a 15% speed bonus for working in a lit workspace. And if those percentages are additive, which I think they are, it gives Cali a total of a 25% speed boost. While that 25% is nice, keep in mind that because Cali has a science skill of 17, they are already getting a 680% research speed bonus. I'm also clearing up some space over here. We're gonna be using it shortly because I wanna start getting into some power draw using some of the natural gas, but I need an area that's gonna be far enough away from our crops and our base so we're not heating all this up. Which, to tell you the truth, is not gonna be a problem, but I'm gonna save that surprise for a little bit later. Plus, we also just wanna sort of clean up the area, turn this place into a more livable dumpster fire. Another great side effect of cleaning all this up is we're dropping all this polluted water, and by doing so, it raises the level here, which pushes the carbon dioxide further up, which will keep our dust caps growing. Well, at least for the most part. I am going to try to keep this area water free. So we're probably going to end up having to pump this out manually. And look at this diamond sitting in here. Ooh la la. Of course, there's also more polluted water down here. Quick liquid pump, a short pipe run a well-placed bridge, and finally we end up back at our liquid vent. Now I just gotta get power over there, and power is still sort of janky. The only upgrade I've done is adding another battery, and that way when the plug slugs are providing power, there's more capacity for all that power to go into. We're not running too much, in the last five cycles only 34% of the time, so we still have some time. And then one long two-strand wire run later, our pump will start pumping all that out. I'm also needing to get all this cleaned up so I can tap into this clean water. We'll probably also pump it over into this tank. I suppose we could also just disable this pitcher pump and use a pincher pump here and move it that way. I'm also gonna have to work on oxygen flow because while there's plenty to breathe over here, it looks like while they're sleeping, it's not going very well. So I think we'll start by improving the bedrooms a little bit. And this will allow all this oxygen to more easily go into here because what's happening is as they're sleeping, 
Carbon dioxide is also interfering with the flow of oxygen in here. I'm also going to start putting some airflow tiles whenever we can. This will help the carbon dioxide escape from these tanks, which will have a twofold effect. One, more carbon dioxide down here is better for our dust caps. But two, if we can keep the carbon dioxide out of the polluted water tank, it'll allow more of this polluted water to off gas, creating more delicious polluted oxygen. And look at it already starting to flow out. Eventually we'll have to deal with the carbon dioxide, but not for a very, very long time. Oh, Colonel Sanders, how did you do this one? I suppose they built themselves in by completing this tile in the absolute wrong location. No, okay, but just two more. Two more and you'll be able to get down. You're doing great, almost there. And freedom, way to go. Well, the water from up here was almost a perfect drop until I noticed it slipping back this way and going into my newly revealed fresh water. If the dupes hurry, I'll be able to do that crazy underwater mop thing. Oh, it's gonna go everywhere. All right, somehow I've managed to make the dumpster fire worse. Give me a few more minutes. I'm finishing up some more research and I'm gonna get this whole thing cleaned up. I always love that around these metal volcanoes, you can find some refined metal. I mean, this is a few tons of gold that we won't have to worry about throwing through a metal refinery. That's awfully convenient. I also wanted to give you an update on the tank. All that carbon dioxide is pretty much gone. And you can tell because the air pressure around here has skyrocketed. We're up to about 1700 grams of polluted oxygen pressure. So even though it's cycle 71, we still don't have to worry about oxygen for these dupes. And after a few short cycles, this colony is actually starting to look a little better. We've knocked out a bunch of tier one and tier two technologies that we're gonna need for this upcoming build that I keep teasing. We've cleared out all this area and now we have so much room for activities. We're still draining this pond here, but afterwards we'll also kick down this wall, which will allow all this carbon dioxide to also flow down here. So now it's time to send poor Callie over to the other planetoid. Now Callie does have plenty of galleries here, so I'm not too worried about it. We also have a lot of Hexland fruits, but the primary mission of the day is going to be analyzing this geyser and activating both the supply teleporter output and the supply teleporter input. And the reason for that is because I don't plan on having dupes live on this planetoid, at least not yet. But until Clay makes my dreams come true and allows power to go through these supply teleporters, we still have to bring power over here. And this colony has a peak light of 30,000 lux. It's not a ton, but it should be enough to run the bare minimum of equipment such as a liquid pump. The problem with that, of course, is it's also locked behind renewable energy. In our next pod, I'm starting to look for another researcher because having two would be awfully handy, especially considering our primary researcher, Callie, is on the other planetoid. And there's a few okay dupes here, but I'm not willing to take one just for the sake of taking one, so free food it is. On the subject of that radiation research, it is sort of a problem of what came first, the chicken or the egg. We have plenty of radiation to tap into, no big deal. But radiation research is power intensive because of rad bolt generators. But in order for my grand scheme to come to fruition, I need to tap this natural gas geyser. In order to do this, I need steel. And I plan on using that metal refinery system in combination with this nice and cold polluted water. In order to do that though, I need power over here, which our current plan is solar, which once again brings us back to what came first, the chicken or the egg, because our solar power requires radiation research. And the solution of course, is just to make these dupes run more often. After all, we only have to knock out 20 material science research, so it shouldn't be that big of a deal. And I know what you're thinking. Echo, just start ranching the plug slugs already. No, I don't want to. Yes, this planetoid will always have a beautiful supply of refined metal because we have so many metal volcanoes. We will not always have a beautiful supply of ores. And these plug slugs are hungry boys. They eat 60 kilos worth of metal ore every cycle. Let's say we only do four plug slugs. That would be 240 kilos per cycle. And another way to make it sound a little bit more grim is one ton of metal ore every four cycles. And that's if we're only running four slugs. Now I wouldn't fault anybody for making that decision because there is a lot of metal ore here, but I just prefer to be a little stingy with my ores. 
doing some digging over here, I just found another four tons of sand. That's a pretty good boon. We're now up to 14 tons of regolith and about nine tons worth of sand. And so far, the only thing we need sand for is running this water sieve. Now, it's not going to be an issue in the long term because we're going to have a source of sand. And ideally, we're going to be using the rock crusher to get it. Going from dash of salt vines, that'll produce a salt. And then we break down that salt and we get some table salt and more sand. And we're going to grow the dash of salt vines using this wonderful chlorine gas vent that everybody always wants me to use. The problem is... I just need to find a dash of salt vine. And I know there isn't any on this planetoid, and I don't see any on this planetoid either. Which means we're going to have to go to space. Which is, again, not too big of a deal, but we're going to have to do that without the assistance of oil and also plastic. Because we don't have any oil reservoirs either. Not to mention, I also like to use Dracos to make plastic, but we don't have any Dracos either. Which also means we're not getting our hands on a steam turbine for quite some time. Not a big deal, just another, you know, chicken and egg situation. We have finished analyzing the cool sauce geyser and the news is not great. Our average output is only 1.4 kilos per second. I was really hoping for a geyser that was gonna be at least two kilos, possibly even three kilos per second, but sadly, we don't have that kind of luck. Now there's some important math we need to consider here. If we ever had dreams of running an electrolyzer, Remember, electrolyzers can use up to one kilo of water per second. And for that one kilo of water per second, you're given eight duplicates worth of oxygen. So when we do the math here, 1.4 kilos of water per second is only enough for 12 duplicates. Now we do have a little bit more because we're getting 1.43 kilos per second. Plus, we're gonna be able to capture some polluted water by throwing this natural gas in natural gas generators. We also have access to a hot polluted oxygen vent on Topia Rallin. So we do have some wiggle room, it's just not a lot. We're starting to put a floor around this satellite. And that way when the duplicates are running up here, they're not gonna get radiation sickness. Well, at least not a lot of radiation sickness. Eventually we'll be able to upgrade these tiles to something like plastic that'll have more of a radiation resistance. But the granite's not bad with a radiation blocking percentage of 56. With this geyser analyzed, it is time to send Callie back home. And as soon as this teleporter transmitter is finished recharging, which takes a total of five cycles, it's at 83% right now, we'll send another duplicate over to do some construction over here, who's a lot better at building things like the liquid pump and eventually the solar panel way up here. But we also needed Callie over here to start doing some more research, starting off with the material science research. Our next pod came up and I think we're gonna grab this Ada. I've never really had an operator researcher, but considering this dupe is gonna be the secondary researcher, I suppose it makes sense that they can also do some operating of machines. Their traits are just fine, so welcome to the colony, dupe number nine, Queen Calero. And since we know we're gonna have a max of probably 12 dupes, I figured we might as well build their barracks now. And then I remembered, I actually have some of the different blueprints for the cots. So why haven't I been using them? The poor dupes have been in normal cots this whole time. There we go, that's much better. Now after we do some sweeping up here, the duplicates will have a cozier place to stay. Well, other than this poor dupe, because this poor dupe has been sleeping in quite a bit of radiation. I'm gonna be able to fix that but just by putting a wall here and it'll reduce that radiation enough to where it won't matter too much. There we go, that looks a lot better. I especially like how the polluted oxygen really makes the pastel blue wallpaper pop. On a more serious note, it is time to get our material study research on and by putting it right here, you can see the duplicate that's doing the research won't be standing in radiation. Although the duplicate building this rad bolt generator is gonna get plenty of radiation. We're also gonna use some of that beautiful refined gold that we found earlier and put some automation on this. And that way, whenever the material study terminal is filled with rad bolts, we're gonna turn it off. One automation wire, a knot gate, and then right into the rad bolt generator. Material study terminal sends out a green signal whenever the rad bolt storage is full, knot gate turns it to red, red signal turns off the generator. This will also be handy for power. Now, the only difficult thing is because of our setup, I don't want to overfill the material study terminal because then we'll have rad bolts shooting across here, which means 
some dupe trying to get ready to go to sleep is going to get beamed in the face by a rad bolt. And since duplicate safety is priority number one here in Dumpster Fire, we're going to try to work around that by putting in a triage cot. Actually, I think I can do even one better. If I lift the material study terminal and the rad bolt generator by one, that way when in the eventuality that a rad bolt does go past the study terminal, it'll be on this line here where dupes typically aren't. The only time a dupe will be able to get hit is if they're climbing up this ladder. There is a chance the dupe working at the study terminal will get hit, but it's relatively low because if they're working at the study terminal, that means they're using the rad bolts, so the study terminal will accept more. At least this is the theory. We'll see how that goes. Now the rad bolt generation here is pretty decent at 154 rad bolts per cycle, and that's because we're seeing 1500 rads per cycle. We're gonna leave the rad bolt generator on 50, and the reason why is because the smaller amount of rad bolts I can send, the less of a chance that we're going to overfill the study terminal. Now eventually, I'm going to have a rad bolt chamber in here, so we'll be able to more precisely control that flow of rad bolts and keep quite a bit in stockpile. We could then have the material study terminal tell the rad bolt chamber that it needs rad bolts, and we'd be able to deliver them much more precisely. Unfortunately, it's also locked behind research, so baby steps. So I was slightly off. When 50 rad bolts came out of the generator, we ended up with 49.2. So the way we can look at it, this is eight tiles away. So it looks like we're losing 0.1 per tile. Hold on. I think I have a better idea. Okay, this is going to work much better. Rad bolts come out. They go into this material study terminal. Dupe shouldn't be running back and forth here very often. But if there ever are any extras, it'll go up through here and then into this material study terminal. This is sort of the backup study terminal. I'm also gonna put this one on a higher priority. So if it ever does have rad bolts in it, Cali will do the research here before they will do the research here, I think. And it worked just fine. We have 100 rad bolts here and 39 rad bolts here. Now I'm just waiting for our researcher to come and see which one they choose to go to first. And Callie did choose to use the top material study terminal first. And just like that, we finished renewable energy. Man, now I wanna get all the goodies. We'll need a glass forge to start making glass. Easy peasy. Now it's time to send someone back over to the other planetoid. And I think in this case, we're gonna send somebody with some digging skills such as Naz. First things first, we are gonna professionalize this vent, tidying it up just a little bit. There we go, that looks a little bit better. Now we'll need a liquid pump. We have plenty of aluminum and iron over here. We're gonna use insulated piping on the planetoid. This planetoid's cold enough, and I'm actually gonna be using the chill coming from this polluted water. So it's important I don't lose too much of it just by traveling through pipes. Look what I just found. It's a dash of salt vine. This might be the only one on this planetoid, but it's exactly what we needed. So I'm gonna make sure that I don't bother this thing until it's time to get that system going, but I was very excited to see this. Over on our main planetoid, I was busy saving the fishies because we finally finished taking all the polluted water out of this tank when I noticed I messed up. I didn't see that this metal volcano had five neutronium patches. So when I was digging around it, I simply went over and up too, and this was the tile I was assuming that was gonna keep the cork on this volcano. Well, you can see this copper volcano only has four neutronium, and this is the right tile for it. The only other way I can think of to make sure that this volcano is now uncorked is to click the analyze button. If Callie comes over here and tries to analyze it, that means it's uncorked. And so I need to put some insulated tiles around it rather quickly. Oh yeah. We'll at least get the analysis out, dig this up, sweep it up, and then as quickly as possible, do one of these numbers here. For some reason, the move command is saying this is unreachable. When the duplicates can clearly get over there, and they can clearly get over here where the drop-off points are. Let me try canceling these and then doing them again. Nope, still says unreachable. All right, what am I not seeing? This is confusing. We have a dupe with the critter ranching in Majin Lord. The dupes can obviously get over here. Let me do a quick reload and see if that changes it. Reloading did absolutely nothing. 
Yeah, I've tried a couple different things and I still have no idea what's going on. So unfortunately, I'm just going to have to keep these fish flopping around. Let me know in the comments below if you've seen this before or if you have any idea what I'm doing wrong. Naz is finished up over on this planetoid. Let me show you what we have. You've already seen the pump system. That's going to take all this delicious cold polluted water and send it to our home planetoid. But we want to start sending this polluted water over as soon as possible, so we need power. Hence the reason Naz is going to be running on a wheel until all of these batteries are full. Now this is going to be the battery banks that the solar panels are going to be dumping their charge into. And I chose this specific area on purpose because of the wheeze warts. Yeah, this place is awfully nice and cold right now, but eventually these batteries would end up heating this area up. I'm hoping that the wheeze warts here will sort of prevent that for a while. I also need to start making a nice flat area for the solar panels. So Naz is also going to start digging all this up. Don't worry, they'll be just fine. There's plenty of air out there. Now over on the other planetoid, we need to start preparing to receive said water. I think we'll use sedimentary rock. We're definitely going to use insulated pipes. And step one's going to be bringing it all the way over here. Then we'll go down our little ladder rung here and end up somewhere over here. Look how much better this whole area looks compared to the start of this episode. Dupes have been doing some good work today. So what are we going to use this space for? Well, you're not going to like it. It's a little weird, I will grant you. And I'm tired of waiting for them to use this, so we're just going to bulldoze this too, because I need this space now, thank you. I also wanted to show you this new notification that we get around cycle 100. It comes up with the message approaching milestone, and then we get a little confetti and a little jingle. Very nice. And here's that ridiculous idea now. Yes, we've heard of a few different types of saunas, such as the dirty brick, the space brick. We've even created a nuclear sauna. But this is the first time that I've done a open sauna. That's right. We're not putting it in a box, at least for now, you know. And the key is in this water. All of this water is going to have incredible cooling potential. So we're going to bring it in here and cool down this entire area. Now, it's going to take a little while because you can see we don't have a lot of refined minerals. So to start off with, we're just going to use this regular pipe, come around and do all sorts of stuff like this, just to keep all these machines and this entire area nice and chill. Because this place is also going to be holding all of that natural gas. Now, this probably will not work long term, but for the short term, it's going to be absolutely wonderful. And you know we're going to need some buffer tanks. How many buffer tanks? Many buffer tanks. That's right. What do we got here? Ten buffer tanks? Absolutely. Now remember, all the water being stored in these buffer tanks is going to be somewhat chilly, which is a good thing. So we're still keeping all of the pipes insulated, and we're not going to turn them into radiant pipes until we get to our open air sauna where we actually need that chill. Another interesting thing about this sauna is the fact that after all that water dumps off its chill, we're going to be using it as coolant for our metal refinery. Will this work? I don't know. Once it comes out, it's going to be a little bit warmer. So then we're going to go back to insulated pipes, jump over there, and then we'll dump it off into this tank. Now, this is once again a temporary solution, because as you can see, we only have so much space to hold more polluted water in this tank. But we'll be working on our complete water processing here in the future. But for now, we need to get materials going, which is going to start off with this wonderful glass forge. Oh, that's not going to work right there. We're going to need to bridge this. And since we don't need a lot of glass, we're just going to drop it right down here. I'm going to put a thick layer of polluted water to absorb that heat. But eventually we'll have these natural gas generators going, which will produce polluted water. And then we'll be gobbling it up as well. All right, so the water is starting to flow and you'll notice it is at minus 13 degrees, which is awfully delicious. And you'll see we already have some chill emanating, even though we haven't converted these pipes into radiant yet. Now, I know we haven't tamed the natural gas guys, but that's OK, because we have dupe power as well. First thing we're going to get going is some refined carbon, say 25, just to start off with. Now, this is going to be a very manual process and hence the reason why I'm only doing 25 to begin with because I'm going to have to control how much water is flowing through here, at least at the beginning. Eventually, once we get caught back up with that geyser, because right now it's dormant, so we only have so much water, 
but eventually all of our chill is going to be stored in these liquid reservoirs. We will probably eventually put it in its own room and seal it off, but for now, this is going to work just fine. For us to make steel to be able to tame the natural gas geyser, we need the iron, refined carbon, and lime, so I need to get a source of lime going. So after all of this, we're finally putting down a rock crusher. And yes, unfortunately, I only have the basic rock crusher. So I had been leaving little buckets of polluted water everywhere around the colony in order to provide a bunch of oxygen. Well, when I turned this bottle emptier on and said, hey, get me a bunch of polluted water, well, they did exactly what I said, which was starting to hurt the oxygen quality in and around the colony. So we resorted to Old Faithful, the oxygen diffuser. Now, right now we have 29.3 tons of algae, so it will last a little while. To be specific, I need it to last about two episodes. All right, I think this is enough polluted water to absorb just a little bit of molten glass. So we'll fire up, let's look at this, 25 kilos worth of molten glass per 100 kilos worth of sand. We need eight batches per solar panel. So I think two solar panels would be plenty. So let's go with 16 batches. Also on the metal refinery, I am going to start getting some gold amalgam to gold and cobalt ore to cobalt because I am going to want to microchip these natural gas generators. The microchips are very small, so I'm not too concerned with using some of the refined metals that way. We also need to get some iron ore because there's not much on this planetoid. Luckily, there's plenty on this planetoid here. So old Naz has been scooping it all in here. We can actually finish with that now. We'll mark this to sweep and make sure iron ore is selected. And we have our first 25 kilos worth of glass. The polluted water is holding firm at 32 degrees. Not shabby. We're almost there. This is such a janky system. We about drain the entire smart battery every time we use the glass forge. But it's okay because we have runners. The iron ore is being sent over right now. When we go over to our home planetoid, there it is. And I'll start off with, say, 10 batches of iron ore. Oh, that smart battery is going to get a workout. I'm considering making a lot more glass because remember the temperature averaging rule. Whenever that 25 kilos of very hot molten glass comes and lands here, it's going to average with the 39 degree glass, in effect, deleting a ton of heat. And it would be nice to have a little bit extra. So let's just go ahead and say 19 for now. I love this. Every time we make a piece of iron, well, the metal refiner has to fill back up with coolant. So all the nice, beautiful, chilled water keeps rotating around and cooling the whole place off. Now, eventually we will not be using the coolant for the metal refinery, but I'm going to see how long I can get this going for. I might even be able to put in a system that says when the coolant is above 25 degrees, well, take it out and then bring in more coolant. It's time to send NAS all of that wonderful glass. We'll allow manual use, manufacture material. There's our glass there. Now we just need power for the conveyor loader. I love the way this colony is turning out. I'm being very methodical about the tasks and what we're doing. And so we're staying ahead of the curve as far as duplicate labor goes. And at last we have some lime, refined carbon, and some iron. Now the only thing we need steel for right now is for the gas pump, which only takes 50 kilos. So we will queue up our first piece of iron. And I just realized I'm going to have to extend this loop here. Well, maybe not. We might be able to fit in enough gas reservoirs under here. Oh, okay, that's not too bad. Four gas reservoirs for one natural gas geyser, that should be good. And once again, we do have the coolant pipes going across it because this gas will be hot. Over on the other planetoid, it's time to put in our pair of solar panels. Delicious. And all we have to do is hook it up with some power. Two strand wire is fine because we don't have that many power requirements nor will we ever on this planetoid. Knock on wood. The last little bit of plumbing we need is to get all of the natural gas polluted water up and out of here. I was considering putting a hydro sensor on it as well to keep a little bit of water in here, but I don't think we need to. If I take a metal tile and put it right here and make sure there's a radiant liquid pipe behind it, yeah, the molten glass will be hot for a second, but it should cool down relatively quickly once the coolant passes through it. So without the need for a sensor, we can just grab all the available water and pump it directly out. I have it joining up here at a 50-50 split. 
So all the coolant coming out of the metal refinery, after it's done its job of keeping this entire place cold, will then be sent right back into our polluted water storage. Now somehow, despite the fact that we were absolutely starving, when we began this episode, we're up to 150,000 calories. So I've been slowly digging up some of these dust caps because if we're not eating them, they're just turning into rot piles, and I'd rather not be doing that to all of our slime supply. Even though this asteroid has slime meteors, you never know how much that's gonna produce. More good news, this pod has a pay who's an excellent mechatronics engineer. Yeah, they have decreased digging, but they're a grease monkey who also has operating and supplying. Welcome to the colony, dupe number 10, Lupine Ways. Okay, somebody stole my steel. I know we had some. When I brought it up on the menu, you can see that we had our quick blip of steel, but now it's gone. What did I do? The only thing I've built recently is a mess table for Lupine Ways and a bunch of wallpaper, sour lemon, because this place makes you a little sour, for the Great Hall. We have no plug slugs outside this little ranch, so where is my steel? Oh no. This conveyor loader was still allowing manual use, and since glass was the only thing we'd discovered before, it auto-checked all of manufactured materials. Let's go ahead and disallow everything there, and then send our steel back home. Because there it is, right there. <laughs> now in an attempt to sort of liquid lock ourselves in, I'm building some ladders over here to try to save as much natural gas from escaping. It's got a little bit of polluted oxygen and stuff in there, but that's not a big deal. So the plan is they're gonna dig down in here, the polluted water is gonna come with them, and we're gonna have a little makeshift liquid lock right here. Actually, it'd be even better if we made it further over here, and that way most of the natural gas doesn't fill up in this corridor either. I think we're about done over here on the second planetoid. The last thing Naz has to do is sweep up all this iron and send it back home. The power situation is working perfect. Now granted, right now that pump is not running, but there are so many batteries here and the solar panel will have basically the entire time in between eruptions when the pump doesn't need to run to recharge those batteries. We still have 24 cycles before that's going to happen. I just realized I want to send a dash of salt find seed as well. But I'll make sure I give you an update on how the whole system is working, because right now this planetoid is completely automated. Granted, it's janky automated, but it's automated. Here's our wonderful liquid lock that has given us access to the natural gas geyser. Once it finishes spilling, we'll be able to mop more of it up. No big deal. But now it's time to get in here and insulate this place up. You'll notice I put a bunch of bricks out here because I want to be able to build more insulated tiles without any of this gas escaping, like we talked about earlier. Okay, well, I definitely didn't plan on the natural gas geyser erupting while our dupes were in there, but they're going to be okay. One of our pods recently gave us a pom-pom knit suit. I think this one's going to go to Doritos P. I normally just go right down the list, but it's been a minute since I've seen the pom-pom knit suit, so I'm really excited. Doritos Peeves absolutely got to love living here now. The Beastie just finished up the last tile, and now we have a perfect natural gas container. All we managed to waste is about 15 kilos worth of natural gas that I'll probably corner build in to destroy. I added an Atmo sensor so that we can control it with some automation. For now, I'm just going to say as long as it's above zero grams, we're fine. I don't mind if this whole place vacuums out, but we like to put the control in there just in case. Now, our gas takes the long trip through insulated gas pipes into all these gas reservoirs. From there, it filters all the way up here into the natural gas generators, and whammo blammo, we have power and a little bit of renewable polluted water. Now, the big question I'm gonna have is whether or not four gas reservoirs is going to be enough, or rather hold enough natural gas between the dormancy periods of this natural gas geyser. Oh no. I forgot to analyze it. I gotta get back in there. Unfortunately, it's a little hot when you're trying to analyze the geyser when it's erupting, especially when we had just previously vacuumed it out. So the queen um, has some bandages on. She's gonna be fine. And now it's Callie's turn, but now enough of the environment has cooled the natural gas down, so Callie will not suffer the same fate as the queen. There we go. Now we know that we have 25 cycles until the geyser goes dormant. And it looks like our dormancy period is only about 36 cycles. That's not too shabby. Now, one of the disadvantages of the natural gas geysers is the carbon dioxide they produce. 
So we are going to put down a carbon skimmer close to the center of our base because while our dust caps like carbon dioxide, the dupes definitely do not. But the great thing is we're going to utilize our wonderful bathroom system and tie the carbon skimmer right into it. I just realized I could have made that a lot nicer, so we're going to tie it in like this. That looks so much cleaner. And now carbon dioxide is solved. I know we accomplished a lot during this episode. Everything from solar power on our secondary planetoid to another crazy system of mine being the open air sauna. And temperature wise, it looks absolutely wonderful. I'm looking forward to hearing what you think about this episode in the comments below. So until next time, much love, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.